And uh, I, um, I, uh, one second. Not right. Should I just begin? Yeah, go, go for it. So uh, let me introduce myself and then I'll share my screen. So my name is John Leonard. I'm a professor in me uh, mechanical engineering and in the computer science and artificial intelligence lab. And I uh, started my um, time at MIT as a postdoctoral fellow in the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Lab of the Sea Grant College Program. And so I work with autonomous underwater vehicles and self-driving cars. I've been, I was uh, recently on leave at Toyota at a place called Toyota Research Institute. So I'm helping them with their self-driving car program, but I'm back as a normal faculty member now. Um, and in my talk, I wanted to give you a little glimpse into my personal kind of self-driving journey. Um, and it's obviously a topic of much kind of current interest and discussion. There's a lot of news articles and things. And um, I work on the problem of how robots navigate. And, um, and, and when I give a talk like this, I tend to sh show a lot of stuff and just kind of let it rip. But just, I'll just stop when 40 minutes is up. But I, I apologize in advance. I'm not going to get through everything I could potentially talk about. But I could even come back and talk another time if it's interesting. So, uh, so let me um, uh, share my screen. And then I'm going to go into uh, full screen mode and just jump in with any questions. And um, the uh, for me, oops, let's see. Let me go one more. There's, that's my go here. OK, so um, I want to tell you about some of the challenges and, and opportunities in autonomy and uh, lessons from self-driving cars. And um, for me, um, you know, I usually start a talk by saying, has anyone seen any self-driving car articles lately? And I'd ask the audience to kind of raise their hands. People may have heard that you know Tesla became the most valuable automaker by stock market uh, cap yesterday. Um, we really live in amazing times in terms of what's happening. Um, before that, actually, a, prefer a couple of prefatory remarks. I hope you're all safe with COVID, and you know my heart goes out to all um, of the with the unrest in the last few weeks. Uh, we're really doing a lot of time of reflection on campus about things we can do better, even though we're all kind of virtual on Zoom. Um, it's obviously a very challenging time in our in our country, and um, you know we're we're having very important conversations and uh, trying to do best we can, you know, under these circumstances. And uh, but um, for all those affected um, by all the different crises, you know, um, my heart goes out to you, and I hope you're safe and well. So if we look at the self-driving, uh, one of the things that's happened in this tech community is a lot of the self-driving car companies, uh, Toyota included, have stopped their operations. And so one of the things you'll see articles that folks are trying to use simulation a bit more or replaying data um, to, the, um, to get their systems going. Um, but investments are still coming. And so this is just recently, uh, you know, Volkswagen made, made a big investment in Argo AI, which is a spinoff um, that uh, a startup that Ford is funding. Um, Self-driving has been called the arms race uh, in tech in the 21st century or the space race in tech for the 21st century. Um, and there's obviously a lot of, uh, there was a lot of hype and there's a lot of uh, um, different stories happening. Some folks, a lot of folks really promised 2020 as the year when full self-driving would arrive. Um, and here, um, you know, uh, one, more skeptical articles are coming out. You know, why, why is this all delayed indefinitely? I've actually been a bit of a skeptic as a roboticist. I just think it's gonna take a lot longer than people think. Um, and I've been pretty vocal as a sort of critic, although I do believe in the safety mission and think in the long term that highly automated driving is um, coming. So um, Elon Musk is one of the greatest sort of uh, spokes uh, persons of, of self-driving. And he's made predictions multiple times uh, that you'd soon be able to fall asleep and wake up at your destination using full self-driving. Um, he said this in 2015, would happen in a year or two. Now he's, he said in 20, 2019, it would be in 2020. If we were all in the same room, I would say, who has a Tesla, who has an electric vehicle? Um, oh, oh, by the way, one caveat, my allergies decided to flare up yesterday, so I apologize in advance if I'm any sneezing or anything. It's really just allergies that just hit me um, with uh, cutting the grass and things nearby. Um, so um, the hype of self-driving was kind of at a peak. Um, a little while ago in 2018, Wired Magazine said, autonomous driving has gone from maybe possible to definitely possible to inevitable. How did anyone ever think this wasn't inevitable? Um, but sadly, um, um, very shortly after thereafter, Uber had the fatality in Arizona, Elaine Hertzberg, where um, the car um, wasn't properly supervised by the self-driver and the uh, software had issues. Um, and it was kind of a reset moment for the field. But in practice, actually, a lot more has kind of happened since then um, in terms of uh, 
Uh, someone said you had an electric car. Thanks, uh, Linda. The um, uh, you know, the field's actually still making progress and the investments have not slowed, you know, like that um, link about the article to Ford. And so what I want to attempt to do, and uh, I apologize for going fast, my personal journey, and, and I really feel like uh, you're folks part of the MIT community. Um, I've talked now to, I've spoken now to the alumni groups in Northern California and in Boston, and I, and I just feel um, so privileged to be part of this MIT community. It really, um, um, being at MIT since 1991, almost you know 29 years now, I just feel um, so privileged, fortunate, blessed to be part of this community. But my, I'll tell you a bit about my own journey, some history and challenges of self-driving, what Toyota's doing, uh, this approach I'm helping them to conceive of what we call guardian and chauffeur, um, and then some other kind of research questions. Um, but um, my background, so I, I came to MIT to work with autonomous underwater vehicles um, at, at the Sea Grant College Lab. I actually grew up in Philadelphia. I went to Penn undergrad, went to Oxford for my PhD. Um, and I came um, to, I, I work on this problem called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, which is how a robot builds a map and uses the map concurrently to navigate. So this is a video from about seven years ago, uh, 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 an underwater student actually of mine who also, we also test our algorithms with land robots, with robots with wheels and cameras. And this is going around the data center in MIT. And the goal is to build a map and correct the map as you navigate around closing loops um, uh, and so on. And, uh, but I got involved with self-driving cars around 2006, 2007. We entered something called the DARPA Urban Challenge, which was a high profile robot competition. Uh, and I'm gonna sneeze, I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, I really, um, the, the thing about being at MIT, you have to, um, uh, the opportunities for collaboration, you know, like my lab is in the Stata Center. I was in ocean engineering, mechanical engineering. I was co-director of the Ford MIT Alliance for a while. I was associate department head in MECI. -E, and I feel like um, th there's just that interdisciplinary culture that comes from the interconnected sets of buildings and the way that all the technologies intersect on one another. Um, it really is wonderful. One of my recent endeavors, in fact, I'm staying up late nights to try to finish. I'm part of MIT's task force on work of the future. And I'm finishing a policy briefing with another professor, David Mandel, and one of his students on uh, the impact of autonomous vehicles on jobs, which is a big question. I, I added up just six categories of employment in the US, um, taxi drivers, bus drivers, uh, auto repair, body shops, um, um, uh, a few other truck drivers. I easily and got to over 5 million jobs, you know, in the US. And so I do have, I worry or I have concerns or I think we should think about the future for that. So I'm involved in many different things and I'm just gonna give you a little flavor of, of some of what's going on. Um, if I go back in time, I was a PhD student in Oxford in England. Um, we had some of the earliest sun workstations in the UK. I wanted to have a robot that could navigate around buildings with computer vision. Um, but the, the box to the left of me in this picture was an early computer vision device all I could really do is frame grabbing and edge detection three frames a second. And that cost probably $60,000 um, or more. And uh, it was just really primitive to try to try to do real time computer vision, say that happens routinely now on a Tesla. And I actually navigated, um, my, I had a robot that could navigate using sonar. So ultrasonic ranging sensors that you get from Polaroid cameras that used to have back in the eighties. And uh, my, my dream was to have a robot that could navigate using the geometry in the environment. We called them as geometric beacons. It was sort of like following, if any of you are sailors, how you navigate, you know, using landmarks on shore, you know, um, lighthouses and such. So how, how do we have a robot that can have objects in the world serving as landmarks and correct the dead reckoning error growth of its, of its trajectory? And so um, uh, in 1991, I was so fortunate to, to, to be invited to be a postdoc at MIT. Um, I've truly found paradise, if any of you know uh, what that means, uh, um, IHTFP. And uh, my, uh, I started in building five over here, uh, move, I'm now in building three in, in mechanical engineering after the OE Mechie merger. Uh, we do a lot of our tests of our robots in the, in the Charles River. Um, we, we have a nice little setup at the MIT Sailing Pavilion. Uh, and uh, I, autonomous underwater vehicles actually um, this is one of my early students doing autonomous underwater vehicles work. This was a Woods Hole Oceanographic AUV. The person in the red jacket here is now somewhat famous. Um, his name's Chris Cassidy. He's the uh, uh, captain of the International Space Station right now. If any of you saw the Crew Dragon uh, um, docking, Chris was the person spending a few hours getting set up. Um, he is a Navy SEAL officer, and this was uh, one of the first Remus prototypes. These are some vehicles that came from MIT, the Odyssey vehicles, 
by a company called Bluefin. And on the left here is one of the, what are called the Odyssey 2 prototypes. And in fact, um, um, I'm deviating from my autonomous underwater, my self-driving car script a little bit because I couldn't resist for the New Hampshire Alumni Club. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, I'm gonna take way too much time on this, but uh, I love New Hampshire. I have just incredibly fond memories. We developed this vehicle, the Odyssey, for a trip to the Arctic. And we needed an approximation of under ice operations. And I don't know if anyone here remembers uh, the, the winter of 1994 was actually a pretty cold winter with a lot of snow. And I'm gonna play a little news clip here. Its name here. is Odyssey, an exciting new and powerful research vehicle helping scientists explore the secrets of the oceans. Tonight, we're gonna to take you on a trip to New Hampshire to see our little sub built at MIT is changing the way we look at the world underwater. A quiet winter's day on a snow-covered Lake Winnipesaukee. But here among the picture-perfect scenery, a strange visitor has arrived and with it, some pioneers from MIT. We're at the forefront of a brand new technology that's going to completely revolutionize the exploration of the oceans. Okay, Jim, you think we're ready? That was me. We, so we cut a hole in the ice. The ice was 18 inches thick. Called Odyssey 2 was a powerful and relatively inexpensive robotic sub designed to travel where humans cannot. That was our lab leader, Jim Bellingham. For the last several weeks, Odyssey we ran our vehicle for the first time ever under the ice in February in Winnipesaukee. will help scientists study the mysteries of the underwater world. Though the oceans cover some two thirds of the planet, compared to space, little time and money has been spent studying this last frontier. Here we have a chance to explore the oceans. The oceans offer tremendous resources. Uh, it's it's the last area which is uh, unexplored. And uh, there's incredible mineral wealth, there's scientific knowledge to be found. Uh, it's untapped resources. And vehicles like this will enable us to tap into that. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. So we had to run our vehicle untethered in the Arctic. And so to do that successfully, MIT built sub unique is that unlike other submersibles, it's not permanently tethered to an expensive mothership. It is self-sufficient and small enough to run oceanographic missions at a fraction of the cost of manned vehicles. With a weight of just 250 pounds, Odyssey 2 can travel up to 170 miles and at depths of 20,000 feet. This is the underwater net that catches the Odyssey 2 on its return journey. The question is, will it ever come back? For that, many complicated electronics are required. So the project director, Jim Bellingham, showed me the intricate computer system which makes up the vehicle's mind and body. So I'm going to pause this here for a second. Um, so our, our vehicle is sort of built by undergraduates and grad students, and it was this sort of this very creative, low-cost design that the kind of conventional wisdom was you couldn't build a low-cost vehicle. And certainly deploying it under the ice as the first mission was a little bit crazy. Um, but um, anyway, we, we practiced for five weeks in New Hampshire and we actually ran the vehicle under ice. It used transponders and uh, we, we did, it did actually learn how to home into a pinger. Right, into a net. Ping. So here, here it is. Yes! Nice. Whoa. <laughs> so we, uh, um, and then uh, a few weeks later, we went up to Alaska and we did, um, one second, uh, do I have that picture here? Anyway, we, we went to, um, um, 115 miles north of Dead Horse, Alaska, and in, uh, on five feet of Arctic ice, we cut a hole in the ice, uh, and we, um, we flew out on little Twin Otter airplanes, and that's our gym, our leader, and our vehicle um, was uh, innovative for its time. It looked like a bomb hit it when you opened it up, but we actually ran on tethered operations uh, in the Arctic that we practiced uh, in New Hampshire. So uh, New Hampshire was really a pivotal place in my career. Um, so anyway, this, this problem, I talked a little bit about SLAM. The, the goal for robot navigation is how do you represent the world? There are these different challenges. So in my 24 years as a professor, I've supervised 23 PhD theses to conclusion. I have about 10 students in my group now. And my students think about how robots can represent the world, how they can perform inference, machine learning, data association, um, and how can you build systems and make them autonomous. And ideally you do it underwater, but also for terrestrial applications like self-driving cars. Um, so later, like many years later, this um, SLAM technique we got working for the Navy um, for mine hunting. So this was a project I did um, for Office Naval Research where we we're basically trying to use low cost sonars and low cost vehicles to reacquire mines 
and find them um, for, for the Navy for reacquiring so that a person doesn't have to do it. So um, anyway, but somewhere along the way, even though I was an underwater robotics researcher from ocean engineering, I got involved with self-driving cars uh, and I was a team leader for the DARPA Urban Challenge, which was a competition uh, run by the government. And it was really kind of like a Woodstock of robotics. We were on a reality TV show. This is a little clip from it. robotics community to create a car that can drive itself. This is just about the hardest thing you can do to an autonomous vehicle. Despite the long odds of winning, more than 80 teams have jumped at the chance. The biggest challenge is dealing with the unexpected. For the elite few who reach the finals, a $2 million prize is at stake. Which robocar will be first to the future? When robots that was our car. No that was one of our students. Power. That wasn't our car. So unfasten your seatbelt and get out of the car. The roughest race without drivers is about to begin. Okay, so, um, so this is another one of those. I could give a whole hour talk on this. Um, but oh, we built a team so interesting. Uh, to uh, try to compete in this competition. It was $2 million for first place, $1 million for second place, half a million dollars for third place, nothing for fourth place. Um, remember that. And uh, we had this interdisciplinary team with Core 6, the ECS, my, colleague, my late colleague, uh, dear friend Seth Teller, um, Core 16, Jonathan Howe, um, Amelia Fazzoli, um, um, Sertes Karaman is now a very successful um, uh, professor in Aerostro. He was a master's student. Uh, Carly Nemo was a research scientist in Meki. Um, the people in these pictures, so this is a 2007 team photo from the DARPA challenge. A lot of the people in these pictures are now, have now gone on to great success in tech um, with startups and various things. Um, the third person in this guy, um, he's in shadow, Yoshi Kuwata. He's one of the engineers who landed the rockets back on earth uh, for, for Elon Musk. Um, and uh, so, Let's see. So the DARPA challenge, we, there was a new sensor developed called a Velodyne LiDAR. This is the data you get for driving up Mass Ave from MIT to Harvard Square. It would give you a million data points per second. And um, in a nutshell, the way our algorithm worked is the perceptual data was used to kind of find the road surface, find obstacles, try to predict their um, um, future positions, like if their cars, how they might move, and then connect that to a real-time motion planner that, that used a kind of local model of the world to try to guide its path. And it's a very long story, but we were one of the of, uh, six teams that finished the 60 mile competition. Um, we did finish in a pretty distant fourth place, um, but it was sort of a, uh, just a, such an incredible experience. Our students were so innovative and risky and, and uh, uh, these are kind of anxious moments, you know, watching our, our data logs after our robot went off on its own on, on a mission. Um, you know, meet long, late nights in hotel rooms, actually just like in uh, Guilford, New Hampshire, you know, writing code in hotel rooms at the Greystone Motor Lodge, um, writing code, and, and uh, this was out in California. Um, and at the end of the, our robot had more processors and more sensors than any other team. We did, we wanted to kind of, at MIT, we're almost encouraging our students to try to live in the future, imagine what life will be like five, 10, 15 years from now. And we didn't want to be limited by um, uh, uh, not having enough computation. So. Um, it was a bit of a, a lot of overdesign. We needed a six kilowatt generator to power uh, the computers and sensors and air conditioner to keep them cool. And so to make a long story short, um, Carnegie Mellon came in first, Stanford second, Virginia Tech third. We came in fourth, but our robot had a more ambitious perception driven approach. We tried to navigate a bit more like a person where you might have a course map. Uh, the other teams more blindly followed GPS waypoints, um, which we didn't think DARPA would let you do. Um, but in the end, uh, they kind of made the project uh, a little easier. One of the things that happened along the way, and even though we finished the competition, we did have a few incidents where they had to stop everything. They had ways to emergency stop the vehicles. And uh, this was a, a little incident we had with Cornell. Um, I show this partly just to say how far the technology's come in uh, 12 or 13 years, even though um, um, you know this wasn't our finest moment, but uh, I'm gonna, this is about five hours into Let's the six in hour race. With the boss. That's Carnegie Mellon who won the race. Um, this was the webcast. Second vehicle to cross the line at the end of mission two behind Virginia Tech. We were trying to pass Cornell for about four or five minutes. There we go, got a little issue. Cornell were having a problem with their controller, their actuators. They, the car was stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And, and it looks like they're, the, the 79 is trying to pass and has passed the chase vehicle 
for Skynet, the 26 vehicle. Wow. And Talos. now he's going to, and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. And Whoa. Oh, we had our first collision. Crash in turn one. Oh, boy. That is, you know, that's a bold maneuver for uh, MIT to try and pass. And I'm sure the... Uh, so what happened? Okay, so with a robot car, you can kind of look inside the brain. Um, you can try to see what happened. So we have these data logs. So obviously, um, data capture is really important. We try to learn from incidents or near misses or rare events. Um, and this video shows um, we, have, we, we, we use more vision than the other teams. We're trying to use vision to detect drivable road surface. Um, the state-of-the-art in computer vision for object detection was too primitive then. So right now, it's real easy for a computer vision algorithm to say that's a car, that's road surface, that's a tree. Um, but back then, we were using the LiDAR data to detect cars. So what I'm going to do here is play the video. And, and to our car, a slowly moving or stopped car is actually a really hard problem, even today. Um, and so to the LiDAR scanner, we, it just looked like a blob of points. And we didn't have a classifier to say, hey, that's a car. And it turned out that we had four or five bugs. And Car uh, uh, Cornell had three or four bugs that kind of interacted in this strange way to cause this kind of accident. And so like explaining this picture fully would be like a 10 minute kind of story. But this is the RT path planner, generated paths, the robot chooses a path, but it's not smart enough to realize that that's a car that, that we don't go, don't go too close to it. And there were some other bugs. The, the DARPA wanted us in a single file here, even though the road was really wide, the actual um, guidance instructions were to try to be like in single file there. Um, and, um, so we, at that, this was 2007. In the next year, we uh, traded our, our data logs with Cornell and we wrote a journal article um, um, about the MIT Cornell collision and why it happened. Um, and with uh, some Cornell faculty, including uh, Dan Huttenlocker, who's now our, the Dean of our new College of Computing. And um, it was sort of like a 38 page peer review accident report, you know, like, um, and, and uh, if you ask me then, I would say we're a long way from self-driving cars that could say, for example, drive from um, Newton, where I live, to Laconia, you know, just completely hands-free. Um, but some pretty amazing things happened um, after then. And uh, so actually the reason, the bug, um, the reason why we got in the crash, the, the biggest reason amongst the different bugs was that we had a threshold in our system. And if anything wasn't moving faster than three meters a second, we didn't give it the kind of property of being a car. And so systems like this have, this have a lot of thresholds, a lot of parameters that you need to tune and it takes time and testing. And we were like writing up to the last minute in hotel rooms. And so um, this is just saying if the velocity is greater than three and it's more than eight uh, time slices old, then you can use it in your predictor, but otherwise we didn't. So, um, but this is Luke Fletcher, who is our postdoc from Australia, Ed Olson, who's faculty member now at, in, in Michigan. And uh, there's just this incredible culture of when you take robots out in the world and you try to get them to do uh, ambitious things and uh, uh, and I just have really fond memories. So that was 2007. What's happening today? Well, if you go back into this picture, um, that guy Ed, who I talked about, um, he's he's got his own successful startup, May Mobility. Sertesh Karaman is, uh, and he's tenured at Michigan. Sertesh is tenured at MIT, co-founded Optimus Ride, another electric, small speed electric startup with Albert Wang. And Mayor Fazzoli is now, uh, was a professor in our faculty many years. He's now in Switzerland at ETH. He founded a company with Carl, uh, called Newtonomy with Carl Agnema. They were bought by Delphi to make Aptiv. Um, and uh, the, the, um, it's amazing like what our students and our alums go on and, and do. Um, so that's Optimus Ride. They're running in Manhattan. May Mobility are running in a bunch of cities. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my personal journey in some ways. And uh, I'm going to... Um, Feel free if you want to like stop any questions. I realize I'm doing like a fire hose. Um, the, um, I'm going to just quickly talk about some of the history and challenges of auto autonomous driving. Now there was some prehistory of, history of autonomous driving like in Germany and various uh, really ambitious uh, Carnegie Mellon NavLab. But the modern era, kind of the last decade of really big investment, it came from the Google car project. So after the DARPA challenge, Google secretly hired the top engineers from the Stanford and Carnegie Mellon teams. And about 15 people, they had uh, a few Lexus, uh, sorry, a few uh, at that time Prius prototypes. And they did a secret project to try to drive um, in California. And John Markoff of the New York Times broke the story in October, 2010. And uh, it, it was really sort of a marvel that, um, wow, that this was really, um, really happening. Um, and um, the Google founders, uh, 
just just inve have invested so much in this technology, billions and billions of dollars. And there's something really elusive about self-driving. It looks really easy. It looks when it works, it's magical. And it might work 99% of the time. Um, I got to ride in one of the Google Lexus prototypes in 2014. And I'd like posted on Facebook, amazing ride today in the Google car. I felt like I was on the beach at Kitty Hawk. It really was flawless. Um, this is with one of my grad students, Ross Finman, who sadly dropped out of his PhD after five years to go off and do a startup um, doing virtual reality for Pokemon Go. His startup was acquired by uh, Niantic Labs. And, um, but uh, the potential benefits, so why so much investment? So the upside of autonomous driving, like the kind of the positive side of the hype equation is just, it's, it's such a huge opportunity. Um, safety alone, you know, nearly 40,000 fatalities uh, in the US each year, over uh, 1.2 million worldwide. Um, human error is cited in a vast um, number of accidents, over 90%. Um, so safety is what kind of gets me excited to, to wake up in the morning. Um, I believe that we can dramatically reduce accidents with, with, with our superhuman sensing and our prediction and uh, planning. Um, beyond safety, you can think about trying to improve the efficiency of the road network, making time loss to, to, to commuting more leisurely and more valuable. You can imagine what, what would be the cost of all the parking lots in New York City or Boston if you didn't have to park cars. And you can imagine new models. And I think with COVID, some of this is kind of happening a little in a more accelerated way, but like, you know, robotic aided models for how people and goods move through the world. I call it the physical internet. Um, and, um, but um, there are still a lot of challenges. And so if you, if you um, so I've, I've sort of been a, a pretty big critic of a lot of the hype of self-driving in circa 2013 to 2017. Um, and obviously there are a lot of questions Technological is what I'm sort of qualified to talk about, but I'm less qualified to talk about it, but economic and employment issues, there are ethical questions, you, you know, probably familiar with the quality of the trolley problem, legal and policy questions, um, hacking, cybersecurity, and then the energy implications. There's a lot of hard challenges. So one of the things that I've tried to do is really be honest with the community and, and, and is about what some of the hard parts are. So just briefly to help with clarifying terminology, there's something called the SE levels of automation. Um, so a level um, one car might have just one degree of freedom control. So adaptive cruise control. Um, uh, a level two car could ha has um, both um, latitudinal, latitudinal and longitudinal control, but a human has to be ready to take over at any time. Level three is when um, the, the driver could relax and they might be given, say, 15 seconds notice before they have to take over. This has sometimes been, it might see its first application in, in traffic jam pilots, you know, traffic jam assists. Um, um, but in level two and level three systems, the human is responsible for the car at all times. Um, and so Tesla Autopilot is a level two system. If you read the manual for their, quote, full self-driving feature, it says this car is not autonomous. You must be pay, may, pay attention at all times. Um, level four is when the car really has, say, no brake, no accelerator, no steering wheel. Um, the car is going to do all the driving in a restricted domain. And level five is the kind of the more like aspirational, possibly decades from now, is the car that really could go anywhere that a human could and perhaps even run uh, uh, in, uh, completely unoccupied. So part of the confusion relates to the different terminology and the different situations um, of, of the different kind of types of self-driving. So for me, um, I, I, I navigate, you know, Newton to Cambridge for, for work, commuting, and I, I actually obsess over the driving task. How would a self-driving car handle this situation? How would a self-driving car handle that situation? Um, so I just, um, back in 2013, I just picked some everyday real world examples. So this was trying to make a left turn a cold winter day in February. Um, there's two middle schools, a high school and two elementary schools within a half a mile of this intersection. Traffic backed up to the right, as far as you can see. Um, cars coming from the left with a mailbox, a tree, a telephone pole with occlusions. And I'm just trying to do the simple act of making a left turn, an unprotected left. But I also have to do the kind of social ballet of, nav of negotiating with other drivers. And so you can't see in this picture, but I waved at another driver. She kind of waved back at me, uh, and I, I pulled my car out. But um, um, unprotected left turns are something that the community has only actually really been doing with self-driving cars in, in the last few years, and they're still a little kind of secretive about it. 
Here's another example. So this is on Beacon Street going through Brookline through Coolidge Corner. If any, any remember um, that, I have a police officer waving for me to go through a red light. And then at the next intersection, a police officer is going to wave to stop me at a green light. So if any of you are computer programmers, how do you write the code that says always stop at red lights unless there's a man on the side of the road who's a police officer who's waving for you to go through? Um, these are really hard problems of perception, human interaction, and decision making. Um, this is that same intersection at a different time of the year. So I say, what do you see in this picture? So you see the sun, you see the traffic lights. Um, do you see the police officer standing here while I'm moving my mouse? So you can see his legs, he's got a yellow vest and some shadows. Um, and this police officer was actually waving pedestrians across, even though I was kind of blinded and clearly I needed to uh, clean my, my windshield. Um, and uh, just dealing with the sun is a, is a huge challenge, dealing with rain um, and, and snow, difficult weather conditions. So um, obviously in, in snow, your traction is different. Your sensor might have more false alarms, um, fog, but also, um, you know, there's an expression that um, uh, attributed to Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently dis, uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And there indeed is something magical about self-driving cars, but magicians have secrets behind their tricks. And it turns out that if you look under the hood about how say the Google car navigates, um, they use very precise high definition maps. The maps enable the car to locate itself to a few centimeters of accuracy. GPS alone would not be accurate enough. And so here um, is a, the lighter intensity map that Google uses in Mountain View to localize its car. So it has a prior map um, that's made offline, verified by a human. And then when the car is navigating, it's locating itself down to centimeters of accuracy relative to that prior map. They also have a more sort of um, uh, uh, navigational map that tells them where the lanes are, crosswalks, where to look for traffic lights and so forth. If you suddenly cover the road with snow, um, and my understanding is it snows a lot in New Hampshire, that's my experience. Um, um, it's not just that the traction is harder, it's not just that the sensors don't work as well, but the entire scaffolding on which the AI is built, which is based on knowing precisely where you are, goes away. Because if you take away the ability to see the reflectance from the road surface, you cannot locate the car accurately. If you're just gonna try to follow tire marks, you know, maybe you could, um, but um, it's, it's really, really hard. So to sort of summarize these kind of big questions, the technical challenges are those maps what happens if the world changes? So this is a little bit of construction and an example that Google showed, which is still pretty impressive. Um, but what about roads getting resurfaced? Um, and and um, how do you maintain the maps at scale? How do you deal with adverse weather, not just sunlight, rain, heavy rain, snow, puddles, fog, interacting with people, traffic cops and crossing guards? And then how do you get really robust computer vision where the car's making decisions about detecting obstacles? Um, uh, what you really need is perfect detection but no false alarms. If anyone's worked with sonar, for example, I know Raytheon had a, many years like an underwater sonar uh, operations in New Hampshire, uh, maybe Nashua or that, our BEA systems. Uh, think about in, in, in aviation and defense, um, what are called ROC curves, where you're looking at the receiver operating characteristic curve of your sensor. How do you get to the point where you have very good detections with very low false alarms? So. I talked about the distinction between the levels. So in level two and level three, where the human must pay attention at all times, there's a problem that humans are not good at monitoring autonomous systems. Um, humans can't uh, always be ready to take control when necessary. And sadly, there've been some tragic accidents, say with Tesla Autopilot, where operators were not watching the system um, when, when bad things happened. Um, um, and so Google actually did a lot of testing of a level two, level three system um, back in, in, uh, in Mountain View, um, uh, Los Altos, the sort of uh, Silicon Valley area. They loaned their prototype car to 140 employees uh, in 2013 for up to several months at a time. They were the only people in the car and they said, please pay attention. We're gonna have record you. We're gonna take the car away if you don't pay attention. People said, oh, please, please give me a robotic car. I promise I'll pay attention. But what did people do? When the car does nearly the job perfectly all the time and you just have to take over occasionally, people let their guard down. And so it turns out that in Google's employee trial of their level two, level three system, 
one of their employees fell asleep for 27 minutes driving 60 miles an hour on 101. And this led them to kill the project and say, you know what, we're just gonna go level four. We can't trust the human. But then you really need a system that can handle um, um, invalid perceptual data. So here I have a little example. This is a four years old now, so this is almost unfair. But if you use deep learning computer vision techniques to do object detection, um, you can do what's called semantic segmentation, where say, um, you know, you can segment out and say, this is a truck kind of thing, you know. But um, here's an example of a picture of a person on the side of a, of a van, uh, and it thinks it's a rider or a person, uh, and it's really just a picture of a person. Um, in some ways, computer vision has come so, hard, so far that it's tempting to think we're nearly there. Um, but I'm just worried about the level of reliability need to get very good detection with no false alarms uh, in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in the wild, so to speak. Okay, so Dan, I'm just coming up on 7.05, so it's been about 35 minutes. Um, is it okay too far? Is it too fast, too much? Any questions? No, I think it's fine. Do you want to open it up to questions now? I can start with a question myself. Let me and just go a little bit further, but ask a question now, and then I'll do a little bit more to end. Yeah, please, go ahead. Well, my question is um, about the cost of the thing. Yeah. Do you have any idea of how much um, adding autonomous driving will, will add to the cost of a vehicle, and are people willing to pay that? Yeah, that's a great question. And the whole question of how these models might be profitable. Um, actually, that, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Let me show you. Uh, um, well, remember I showed that laser scanner on top of the car? It's called a Velodyne HDL64. Um, in 2007 for the DARPA challenge, it cost $75,000 for the sensor, okay? <laughs> now this is a bit of a trick question. What do you think it costs today in 2020? Uh, 7,500? <laughs> 75, it's still 75,000. Oh, wow. Okay. For that kind of song, LIDAR, because they've only sold probably hundreds of them. Now, oh. there's a whole gold rush of people trying to make low-cost LIDARs, but um, more like what Tesla is doing, the active safety side, just using computer vision and high-performance computing I think like a company in Germany, ZF, they, they think they could do like an autopilot type package for a thousand bucks I've heard on the radio, you know? Mm -hmm. So some aspects have really dropped, but some haven't. So let me switch gears here and give you a little taste of Toyota. I'm gonna to show you one more video. So, so part of the faculty um, uh, are encouraged just kind of like with, with a limited amount of time to do like leave to industry or go off and go to Washington, find out the real world in some ways and bring it back. And so I got this opportunity to follow a man named Gil Pratt, who's a former MIT professor, who did, uh, he ran something called the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, which was a humanoid robot competition. Um, and Gil, um, for Toyota, they wanted to do a different approach where thinking more about the safety application. Imagine if your car could be a guardian angel, originally Gil said, we just call it guardian, where instead of having the human guard the AI system, what if the AI system guarded the human? So this is a bit like emergency braking, active safety we have now, but let's pull in all of the tricks, all of the, the talents uh, from, from robotics. So, so this is another one of those long story shorts, but TRI was founded. Um, I was one of the first six people on board in January, 2016. Now we're well over 300 people with labs in Cambridge, Michigan uh, and, and Silicon Valley. This was about a year and a half ago an all hands meeting. Um, Gil, Ryan Eustace is a former student of mine who's, who's our uh, Michigan professor on leave doing as the uh, executive vice, senior vice president for automated driving. Um, and um, so what does it take to build a self-driving car? So building hardware, software, safety engineering, this mapping and localization problem is important, perception and prediction, planning and control. We have this thing for the Guardian we call driver risk assessment, where you wanna monitor where's the driver looking and are, do they see threats in the world? Everything's based on machine learning, lots of simulation, data processing in the cloud, designing a good experience for the humor, the user, and then having a vehicle operations team that can safely go out and test the software with a combination of closed course testing and public road operations. And so um, we've done a ton of work and we're, we're, we're aiming for the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. That's all been delayed now, um, but we're aiming to do autonomous driving, what we call chauffeur level four for uh, limited areas in Tokyo. Um, but in parallel with that, we have this concept called so Guardian. And I just wanna tell you a little bit what this Guardian is like. So um, these are some, this is older results, this is from uh, 2017, but we built some prototype cars with something a little different. We put in a second steering wheel. So maybe some of you are pilots, but you know, the notion of having like a dual cockpit, but here these are two independent steering systems where we have the cars 
um, kind of um, almost like the kind of physical um, controls. Think about having a virtual um, interface to the car for the computer automation software and then having a, a steering wheel for a driver in the right hand side that can fit on top of that. And the reason we did this is so that the Guardian software that we can test it in very extreme situations and have the software take over with still having a safety driver that could take over for the software. And so let me just give you a little clip of this. This was a closed course test we did in Texas a few years ago, a sort of proof of concept thing. And uh, um, Ryan is going to be in the driver's seat on the right. Gil is narrating from the back. Our MIT, former MIT postdoc Luke is in the back at the computer controls. Our safety driver Sharon um, is there all the time. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell Ryan to fall asleep. So um, drowsy driving is a drunk, uh, drowsy, dis distracted, the three Ds. Um, so now we're going to demonstrate our Guardian system. We're going to emulate what happens when a driver falls asleep. Guardian can tell if I'm using a camera that's part of the dashboard. The camera can even see through sunglasses in order to see what the driver's eyes are doing or if their head is moving into a position that indicates they're not paying attention. So Ryan, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and pretend to fall asleep. And now Guardian has stepped in, it's driving the car for you, and now it will offer at some point to give it back to you. Why don't you go ahead and take it now? One of the most frightening things that can happen on the highway is when a car in front of you switches lanes to avoid debris. You have very little time to react because your view is blocked by the car in front of you. We have sensors that can see significantly better than a human driver can see. The Guardian is going to take over where a car switches lanes in front of us in order to avoid debris. Here that car switches lanes, Guardian decides we have to switch lanes also and we avoid having a crash. Now Guardian has offered to hand back control and Ryan has taken control back of the car. So today you've seen demonstrations of two basic technologies that the Toyota Research Institute is doing research on. This is all part of PRI's work to eventually build a car that can never be responsible for a crash, regardless of what the driver does. So the dream is to build a car that's incapable of crashing, and it's sort of an aspirational goal, which is obviously very hard. But for our internal discussions, I now call oops, uh, what happened there? Let's go. Um, uh, I say, um, what would imagine a car that stayed on the road, don't hit, stay on the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. How many accidents you could get rid of? Okay. So, so we have a whole research agenda related to computer vision, machine learning, mapping uh, to go with that. Um, um, may, maybe I'll, I'll I'll sort of close here and take some Q and A. Um, and try to reflect it back in, you know, question I can lead you some of the things we're doing on campus with the students and so forth. Um, but um, have any of you heard of Amara's Law? So Roy Amara was a Silicon Valley um, entrepreneur investor. And he said that um, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And uh, Rodney Brooks is a famous AI professor from MIT, you know, pointed me to that. And um, I think that's been the case with self-driving. So I, I think that Elon Musk's predictions of full self-driving where the car goes off and makes you money, that's not gonna happen next year. <laughs> you know, um, for every year that Elon Musk says, I would substitute a decade, right? Um, but, um, but in the long term, I do believe we can take, make cars that are dramatically safer. And I think we'll see more and more automation. But the trick for me, instead of thinking about human replacement, um, I love driving. I love cars. A lot of people do. I would like to see human augmentation so that the car, you know, as I get older, that the car helps me keep sharp perception, that the car can almost sort of predict uh, threats. Like if I'm in an unknown, suppose I was driving in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I hadn't been there in a very long time, and I go around a bend, that it might know that a crosswalk is coming up, that kind of thing. So I, I, I kind of believe in trying to blend the technology to help and make, give humans superpowers but keep the humans uh, in control if we can. So maybe at that point, I'll take questions. John, can I give you uh, a couple data points? Yes, please. Uh, I worked, with, I was in the MIT AI lab in the early 70s. Wonderful. And in the, and in the late 80s, I was working as a product manager for Symbolics, and I was working with salespeople to sell list machines 
to people who were doing AI research. Uh, at Martin Marietta in the late 80s, I saw they were putting list machines in the back of trucks. And they were actually having autonomous driven trucks for the military that they were trying to develop. Now, they were pretty confident that they were going to be able to get the whole things working by, by the year 2000, which I thought was uh, very um, optimistic. Uh, what, I, what I remember is I actually went out and saw one of these trucks once, and uh, I asked them what their problems were, and they said the biggest problem they were facing was that the software had a lot of trouble telling the difference between shadows and holes, and that uh, it sort of became a running joke that this was a truck that was afraid of its own shadow. Yeah. Which you've probably seen cases where that's been true. Yes. So people were trying to do this even as um, the late 80s. And I also went to a naval research group for autonomous undersea vehicles too, who were, what I remember most about that was that they were interested of, could we make a list machine who would pass what they call naval underwater spec, which, which one of the requirements was 100% condensing salt fog, which um, we, had, we had put list machines down back onto a chip then, so this was becoming possible. So I'll just add those data points that this whole autonomous vehicle thing certainly goes back to the late 80s, if not before than that. But I have a question for you. It was mentioned before that we had a member who had a Tesla Model X. So I have a Tesla with the latest, um, it was one of the first ones made with the latest generation of sensors. Yes. Forgetting what Elon Musk thinks that car is going to be able to do, what do you think a, a current Tesla is going to be able to do if I keep this thing for 15 years or more? Wow, that's a great question. Well. Um... You know, I think, but I definitely, I love the history of robotics. A lot of times I'll show videos from the 70s and the 80s. And so I'm very aware of that history. In fact, when I arrived at Oxford as a grad student in 1987, one of the first papers I read was on the DARPA Autonomous Land Vehicle Program, the ALV from Martin Marietta. It must be the problem. They had a camera on the top of the car, but it wasn't, yes. on, it didn't pan and tilt. So to look around the horizon at the mountains to see where they were, they had to rotate the entire vehicle or something. They only had the one camera, which maybe that's fine, you know, in those days. But um, so obviously I want to acknowledge the kind of the longer history. I mean, looking forward with Tesla, it's so hard to predict because we do need the Elon Musk's of the world that just say, you know, this is uh, almost like attempt the impossible. And in fact, the, the crew dragon uh, was, even though it was maybe a year late, that's not so bad for such an amazing, you know, experience. I was just so... Um, heart in my mouth, you know, watching that and how um, that it was a great achievement. So I think that um, the, the key question, and I'm probably going to, in 15 years, Elon Musk would say you definitely would be able to go, on, go to sleep. Like say you have an early flight out of Logan and you just get in your car in New Hampshire and it takes you to Logan and you wake up. I sincerely don't believe we're going to have that in 15 years. I think, I think we're going to get much better lane keeping and avoiding, uh, uh, accidents and more sort of uh, computer vision will be more commoditized prediction capabilities. Um, but I think the, the getting to that point of like, you know, they call, talk about the six nines, like the nine, 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 you know, point nine, 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 nine percent reliability. Um, uh, as you scale out and you have millions of vehicles, what was previously a rare event when you had a hundred vehicle fleet, suddenly they're happening every day. So, so, so it's hard to predict 15 years, but I, I think it's still going to be a, the human has to pay attention system. Would there level be a two. Still level two, maybe level three or in traffic. Even see the problem with level three is the car has to know when it's leaving its operational design domain. I don't know. Did any of you see the uh, photo recently from uh, Taiwan? There was a truck on its side with a Tesla sticking into it. Um, <laughs> it's uh um, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, situation, and, and I want to uh, um, uh, truck on side. It's dangerous, but I want to. It's a. It's a very. Uh, um, it's a pretty amazing. Uh, actually, if, if you'll for, if you if you'll let me, I'm just going to try to show this to you live here because um, it's it's uh, somewhat uh, quite a video. Um, so this is in Taiwan. 
uh, play. One second. So a truck was on its side. There's a white Tesla. I don't think anyone was seriously injured in that, but um, you know, cl clearly the um, um, the uh, there was a there's a challenge of of um, <laughs> you know that kind of there, there's a problem they call the vigilance decrement problem, which is how you how you um, pay attention. Um, I notice a very uh, familiar face, Mike Drucker on the uh, hi Mike. Mike left a note on my desk. You came back for the your fiftieth reunion or? I don't know. It's no longer ago, John. I feel so bad. I, I carried that yellow sticky note around <laughs> in my wallet. I was going to try to reach out to you, and I just the craziness and the busyness. But Mike was the system um, administrator and programmer in the MIT Design Laboratory, uh, where they worked on high precision computational geometry with my colleagues Chris Christos and Nick Patrikalakis to um, for say the Navy's propellers design and and so forth. And the design lab was the um, place that I computationally first connected into MIT as a postdoc. I'm very grateful. Mike was so kind to me when I was a postdoc and a young professor. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, Mike. I, great to see you look so well. Any other, any questions? Any? Sure, it looks like Dan, Dan had, it looked Dan Moriarty had a question. Sure, I have a million, but I won't ask a million. Uh, uh, I'm Dan Moriarty. I'm a, I make a living as defense contractor, and recently there was a conference I was at uh, it was classified, but there was an unclassified session about LADAR or LIDAR. Yep. And of course, uh, we may all realize that LIDAR was essentially invented or developed by the Defense Department for many reasons. And this session was LIDAR for autonomous vehicles. And so we got a, I got a chance to listen to some of the industry uh, autonomous vehicle bigwigs uh, talk about theirs. And there was a guy, been, I don't know if you know someone by the name of Simon Bergies, who works for the, it's not Google, it's the company that makes the Google automotive cars, if they're, they're offshoot. But anyway. Waymo, Waymo maybe? Yeah. Waymo, yeah, he works for Waymo. So he's the senior director manager there. And there's a couple things I learned. Uh, uh, one was that the accident rate, there, it, it's astounding the amount of real-time data they're, they're testing every single day. It's just in the I don't know if it's the millions of hours, but it's ungodly amount of road miles that they're doing because they need to get it out to the point where the accident rate is, I was, if I remember correctly, is currently already as good as human error. So what they need to do is just, you know, sort of, I don't have to be faster than bear, I just have to be faster than you. So the, as long as the cars are better than human error, technically they're acceptable, but of course, perception is one other thing. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 second, the second issue of, I asked him about, asked Simon specifically is what happens when you get in a wreck, uh, when you go to the court, and he said they always win because they have data for everything. So what happens, what you hear in the news that was a fault of the autonomous vehicle, once they get into the court and they replay all the telemetry, they say they, they're able to show that the fault was not theirs. But I'm almost to the question. Uh, what the, what they the industry people said to us in defense is government don't even bother spending any more money on LADAR because the billions of dollars that Google and General Motors and and all the big companies are spending on these cars swamps it so the question for you is given that you have these companies that one more caveat so uh, before I let go um, uh, I also learned that, that, um, uh, 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 Uber, the, the Uber, uh, the, the market, the, the business, it loses money every year and the investors in Uber know they're losing money. And the whole business case of Uber depends on no drivers. It depends on autonomous vehicles. So. I hear that, I hear billions of dollars going into investing. These big companies are already at an accident rate that's on par with humans. And the people that are behind, the, these big investors that are behind Uber are just basically banking on the fact that they're gonna do autonomous vehicles. So given all that, the, the amount of money into it, what do you as a professor at MIT with, without billions of dollars in research grants, what are the niche things that you, you do research on? 
That's a great question. It's so many things wrapped into there. Well, first of all, I would say don't don't believe everything you hear because um, the key question with self-driving is not when will it arrive, but where will it arrive? Um, it's going to proceed gradually and slowly, but potentially over decades. And even though Google have achieved this uh, very, very low incident rate over many miles, um, respectfully to them, I'd say they're still not matching human performance. Humans are really good. Uh, my former student, Ned Olson, he, he formulated a kind of a Moore's law of autonomy. There's something called the disengagement rate, which is how often the human has to take over. Uh, and his prediction is if the disengagement rate keeps doubling every 16 months, kind of Moore's law style, it might take to the year 2035 um, to match humans. Um, and, uh, but as a professor, it's really easy to think you're working in a hot field of robotics. And first of all, there are amazing colleagues at other universities all around the world that my students and I, we have to publish our papers and try to be like advancing over theirs. Um, but then you're competing with industry and you might throw your hands up and say, this is impossible. We're never gonna compete with all the money that Waymo or Toyota or Google ha has. Um, but in reality, there's um, something special about a professor and grad students that a grad student kind of finds a way to approach the problem in a different kind of way. And they ask the question a little differently. And money alone doesn't necessarily translate to innovative ideas. That's, that's one thing. Um, and uh, for the government, like for LIDARs, um, Waymo developed their own LIDAR. So the, the thing I said about the Velodyne still costing 75,000, that's for that original one, which was kind of a special design. Waymo are probably have said they're making their LIDARs quite cheaply and they might even make them available for other cars. Um, but a um, bunch of different things. So, so I still believe that professors and grad students can still generate new knowledge, but you have to pick the problems carefully. You don't want to be directly competing. For example, um, a lot of the processing happens in the cloud for writing papers to develop these algorithms. And like I'm aware of a Stanford paper from a couple of years ago that won the best paper award at a big computer vision conference. To make the plots, the graphs in the paper, they spent $140,000 on Amazon cloud services, services just to get that one paper, you know? Um, big tech companies could easily spend millions and millions of dollars on the cloud processing of the data for their algorithms. There's no way a professor is gonna compete with that. Um, but we live in interesting times. It's hard to predict, you know? Question. Uh, another philosophical question then. Uh, uh, so I commute to Massachusetts every day for work and I'm in stop and go traffic for about 10, 15 minutes of it. On Route and 3 or on, on 93? or I'm from Nashua, so I come down Route 3. So yeah. it's actually not that bad. Uh, you know, I just, I just, you know, it's 45 minutes, just bite the bullet and do it. And so I'm driving, by the way, uh, I don't know if any of you know what this thing is. Uh, it's It's... Uh, I drive a 1971 Pontiac Le Mans uh, every day to work, and Good this is you. a distributor that I'm repairing. Wow! So even though I love, <laughs> what I was your major? Vehicles, Are you course two? Uh, no, I'm I'm uh, nuclear engineering. A double eight, of course six, and then uh, and then Nuki. Um, although I love the whole concept, uh, I will always drive my old car. But what I worry, and maybe this is something somebody could think about, is you know. Massachusetts drivers are known for being aggressive. It's hard enough to be able to deal with stop and go traffic when it's a fight with a, a, a human being. But what if that human being's got a computer on his side and, and all of a sudden I leave just one, literally one millimeter extra and that computer is gonna jam that car in there. So that's what I worry about is people, people aren't gonna buy cars because they're safer, although Volvo will be living doing that. They're going to do it because it's going to be convenient. And somebody's going to flick that, that Audi driver is going to flick that switch to maximum jerky mode, and it's going to annoy the heck out of everybody. So it, it, it's, you know, we, we think of the autonomous vehicles as possibly good, but there could be some, is there any psycho part of psychoanalysis or, or, pro, or, or politeness or any of that going into autonomy? Yeah, that's a great question. So my colleague, Daniela Roos, who's our lab director in CCL and pretty famous professor, she, um, had, a, she had a project on, a, they called it SVO, social value optimization for autonomous driving, where you basically, algorithms that optimize being nice, you know, and I, um, but for um, the opposite, like Tesla has some, 
they even have like labels in their software. Like there's something called ludicrous mode for their acceleration. Uh, but they have another mode for their lane, uh, for their um, adaptive cruise control for following like how many car lengths you are behind the other. And, they, and I think they have a setting, which is uh, something like super aggressive or whatever uh, mode, but it's, uh, um, I, I, it is something to kind of worry about. Um, you know, for that, that scenario you mentioned where if you know that for, imagine if you knew that there's gonna be a 10 minute stretch on route three where the car is gonna go five miles an hour in rush hour, it should be possible to automate that. And, and that's why Audi's, you know, traffic jam pilot. Um, um, but the, if I look, there's a news article from April, Audi gives up on level three autonomous driver assist in the A8. Originally, they were not gonna, originally they were gonna do it worldwide. Then they gave up on the US because of litigation. And I think they may have now given up on the whole world because even though it seems like, you know, 999 times out of a thousand for that 10 minutes, they could basically tell you, look, you can check your emails on your phone. Um, you know, uh, you can take a little rest. Um, we, we know how to drive the car in bumper to bumper traffic and you don't have to worry about it. But maybe the one out of a thousand, the person is something doing something stupid uh, or they fall asleep because they, you know, they had a bad night with the kids or whatever and, uh, and, they, and they don't wake up when they need to. So, so um, it's really the rare events is gonna be the challenge, if that makes sense. Did you see got a question for you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, I can uh, hear you. You said that the, uh, the question was not when, but where. And what I'm thinking about, what about the surface of the ocean, which is two dimensional? Everything moves slower on the surface of the ocean. Uh, and uh, the other thing is on the surface of the ocean, you have good localization because you have your uh, GPS. GPS now. Uh, I'm just thinking of back in the days BC before computers when uh, human beings used to uh, move ships across the ocean by their own wits. It was something that uh, slow thinking people could uh, accomplish usually safely. And is, is there any, uh, anything comparable to the self-driving car going on as far as say commercial shipping? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I have a, co a good colleague named Mike Benjamin. He just became a principal research scientist in, in the department, um, but he was previously a Newark employee for 20 years, uh, the Naval MC Warfare Center doing AI for things like um, um, uh, ship maneuver aids for sub captains. Um, but, but since uh, about 10 years, he's working at MIT with myself and my colleague, Henrik Schmidt, and he develops an autonomy software package um, where one of the things he's worked a lot on is called uh, doing the collision regulations, COREGs. So how do autonomous vehicles know how to behave in either with other autonomous vehicles or human vehicles, kind of obeying the rules of the road of the sea? So we actually had a really uh, strong naval officer, Kyle Warner, who uh, uh, is, got his PhD, he's now DARPA program manager, running a big DARPA, DARPA, big DARPA programs, where he worked on this collision regulation problem and how you avoid collisions at sea, exactly this. But way back 20 years ago, the software we ran, um, um, going back around the year 2002, we started doing experiments in Italy with NATO, and we developed some software called Moose, M-O-O-S. I had a postdoc who wrote, there's a, under the hood in a robot, there's how does the robot send data around between the different modules, and there's some, there's like fully decentralized approaches or more centralized approaches. We made some open source software called Moose Mission Oriented Operating Suite that, um, the, the long story is that when the Odyssey was commercialized, um, the commercial engineers wrote a very big, complicated, crazy, hard to manage corba based C++ operating system that the students couldn't change and it was a mess. And so we wanted something that was lightweight and simple. And we wrote some very simple software, um, um, this gifted postdoc I had is now a full professor at Oxford. And that code lives on today and is used in a lot of systems. And one of the people that uses it is a, um, over in, um, uh, Norway, I think it's Norway, maybe Finland, they're doing autonomous ferries that are running our software for um, some of the decision making for being safe when you're approaching the piers and so forth. But I, I think, and in some ways it's not so much to replace the human pilots, but to, um, if, if it can be safely automated, that it provides it, it basically a safety motivation. But, but the short answer is that autonomous and so autonomous vehicles are really important for some military missions. So some of the sort of power projection missions where they need to cover a big space, the ocean is big. Um, 
if, if uh, it's possible that autonomous surface craft can perhaps in conjunction with autonomous underwater, vehicle, underwater vehicles, if you can solve power and communications, um, that they can be really effective. On the uh, subject of uh, where, uh, is any research going on on developing highways uh, to accommodate autonomous vehicles? And is any of that being implemented? And then separately, uh, 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 in the air, uh, there have been automatic pilots you know, forever. Uh, what lessons learned are there uh, in terms of both use and technology that's being currently applied to land vehicles? Great questions. So um, it's funny, my wife, Mary, I love, you know, she's very, very um, supportive. She keeps thinking, why don't you build these trucks, uh, build dedicated highways, because she doesn't want to be on the highway with automated trucks. Um, but, um, and maybe if you think about the cost of like high speed rail systems and big, it, maybe you're getting into the capital investment where you really could build an autonomous vehicle highway. But I don't think there'd be a strong appetite to do that um, uh, in the short term. You could imagine um, having dedicated lanes. To, to be honest, like a lot of folks think, it, when, sometimes when I give longer talks, interactive talks, I give out a little survey like to use on your phones, like when will autonomous drive vehicles arrive? And then what industries will be most affected? And I have a little survey question. And one of the seven choices is, is, is trucking. And everyone thinks long distance, that the highest uh, score is always for long distance trucking will be the biggest sort of use case. Um, but if you look under the hood, actually, a um, few challenges. So, so for trucking, um, first of all, you got to get across the country without any big snowstorms. So there's a good part of the year when there's a very good chance that there's snow on the ground somewhere across the country for, for cross country. Um, but also, um, it really gets back to that reliability question and, and just having a human truck driver that can kind of handle what, what happens when something unconventional happens, what goes wrong. Um, uh, let's see, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but uh, I think- He didn't try the lane traffic stuff, by the way. What's that? Up in Sweden, they did a test where they put stuff in the, in the roads and found out that you could uh, modify like your car with a thousand dollars worth of electronics and it would track. Cool, cool. There was some, yeah. there was some short term testing, that's all I know. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, so trucking, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I follow these different podcasts and blogs and various things. There's a whole ecosystem of startups and different investors. And, and somebody who had a very high profile autonomous trucking company, recently he gave up after five years and because uh, he couldn't get investment. And he, he's written some sort of uh, secrets behind the scenes blog posts. Um, the name of the company was Starsky uh, Robotics, but like Starsky and Hutch. And he, he basically talks about the economics of the trucking business. And what he was trying to do is rather than 100% replace the truck driver, which is really, really hard to use um, remote control where you could have a truck driver in their house who could basically remotely pilot the truck you know, from hundreds or thousands of miles away and then still be home for dinner with their kids and helping with the homework and stuff like that. So, so trucking is a very special animal. I'm still trying to get my head around it. Um, but it, Apparently things like if you could do automated billing for trucking, you would make a lot more money than you would from autonomy. Like there's a lot of historical inefficiencies and anachronisms and just they have a real shortage of truck drivers. They can't get people to take it because it's such a hard job. And from the air? Oh, air vehicles, right. So I have some wonderful colleagues. So David Mendel at MIT, um, he's uh, uh, in the Science, Technology and Society program and he's also recently moved also to Core 16 in a dual appointment. David's a pilot. He's written some wonderful books. He does underwater vehicles. Uh, and and um, he is an expert in aviation and how humans interact with machines, tragically the Air France uh, 447. And he and another former MIT professor, Missy Cummings, who was one of the Navy's first female fighter pilots, who's at Duke now, um, they have a pretty eloquent story that kind of says that we're completely ignoring decades of lessons from aviation and just making old mistakes again. And so the issues of um, the human's ability to monitor, for example, with um, pilots are losing their skills due to over-reliance on the autopilot. And uh, Tesla autopilot, even though the, the name, you could argue whether it's true uh, in autonomy, that you, you uh, run the risk of de-skilling drivers so that you kind of do 99.9% .9 of the job 
Um, and then when you need them for the 0.1%, when there's a tricky edge case, they're not, they're not ready. Um, in terms of folks have talked about, say, oh, we could do commercial coast to coast flying with no humans on board. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I have a, one of my, my best friend from five years old is a UPS pilot, form, former Navy F-18 pilot on carriers. And he tells me like the life of a pilot, like a lot of times you show up and, uh, you know, one of the instruments on the aircraft isn't working, but you have a second one. And you have to like basically make a human judgment decision and fill out some paperwork for the FAA. Was it safe to fly, you know, and you have to talk to the mechanic. And there's this whole like human judgment thing of being a pilot that seems very hard to automate even just before you go to the flying part you know and so i i am very skeptical that we'll have uh completely uh maybe cargo only maybe in 10 or 20 years but as a passenger i don't want to fly in a plane with no pilots in the cockpit on a on a commercial air travel hey john yeah. cedric oh cedric hi yeah, I have a couple of questions. One, um, do you think that, you know, especially like if you look at, say, the traffic jam issue, uh, would you see that, would there be a need for autonomous cars to communicate between them, between each other or with other cars? And the second thing is, um, you know, you, do, you definitely have LiDAR and vision-based navigation. And I assume that, GPS is part of that too. So, but GPS is uh, subject to either jamming or spoofing. And I was just wondering if there, if that's an issue as well. Right. So definitely, you don't want to rely too much on GPS. Um, it's not accurate enough sure. for the sort of precision location you need. Um, I'm sorry. Repeat the first part of your question because I, I just blanked. Uh, well, is uh, do uh, is there? Would you see there would be a need for autonomous cars to communicate between? Oh, definitely each other, communication. Yeah. Uh, say, so I'm a. I'm a big believer in infrastructure. So the sort of the Google, Waymo, you know, the big tech, they, they want to keep the car self-contained and do everything themselves, um, not rely on any sort of um, cooperation or other signals. Um, but that makes it a lot harder. If you think about my left turn problem, you know, what if the car was saying, hey, I'm coming and it's an occluded, um, we, you know, tragically, the number of uh, pedestrian fatalities is rising. Um, um, and, and cities and uh, due to distracted folks. And, and, and uh, um, I think for cities especially to have communication with infrastructure, kind of like smart traffic lights and communication between cars together, it's a no brainer uh, as a technologist to say, let's make the problem easier. The problem is that thus far, what's called V to X, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communications, it's been sort of this government funded consortia that's slowly moving, you know, incremental. Um, Silicon Valley wants to move quickly. Um, someone needs to come up with a business model whereby like maybe subsidized by insurance that you make it economically effective to add communications devices to mobile agents in the road, not just cars, but maybe bicyclists, pedestrians, scooters. Um, and you somehow monetize making all that work um, to dramatically reduce accidents. But your question's a really great one. I think we need it. Yeah, I guess probably the other issue would probably be security in a sense or privacy issues though, but. Yeah, so I have a colleague, Sanjay Sarma. He's our vice president for digital learning at MIT and he's in Mekki. And I was recently on one of his PhD students committees, uh, Dajiang Su, who's looking at uh, how you try to make uh, either autonomous vehicle sensors or vehicle to vehicle communication systems uh, less vulnerable to hackers and cybersecurity. And there's some really hard problems there because um, it turns out, you know, like people have done tests where they've um, like generated fake LIDAR data that would basically cause the LIDAR to think that there's an obstacle and stop. Um, and there've been some other pub well publicized car hacking and things, but certainly it, it raises really challenging cybersecurity kind of questions because especially for the vision of level five is that imagine you get out of a car and the car, the vision is that the car goes off without you to find the next passenger. What if you leave behind a briefcase with something bad there? You know, like the, the sort of, uh, it, it is kind of a scary thought to think about, you know, what might happen. Other questions? All right. 
Well, thank you very much, John. I think thank we you. Uh, got you for an extra 15 minutes. So. Oh, my pleasure. And if you ever want to hear more about the underwater vehicle stuff, or I have wonderful colleagues, Sangbae Kim with the robot cheetah, you know, Jonathan Howe, I could tell you, you know, if you like robots, uh, you know, Alberto Rodriguez, we've, we've got some wonderful colleagues. Um, and, um, but thank you. If you're ever on campus, drop by, say hello. Mike Joker, I, uh, I promise I, I'll respond better next time, but <laughs> it's so great to see you. And we all, we all miss you. And um, so um, uh, thank you so much. Maybe sometime I could come in person when all this is over. Absolutely. And get your car to drive you here. <laughs> yeah. I remember one last question. There were some pretty bad snowstorms that year in New Hampshire, and one of my co one of my colleagues was a uh, his Jim Bellingham's friend was a guy named Tom Altschuler, was a physics grad student who was helping us with the drilling in the ice and stuff, and uh, I had to drive his car to New Hampshire for him, but it was a manual transmission, and I'd only driven a manual transmission in England as a grad student, so I had to drive in a snowstorm to New Hampshire, shifting the gears on this MIT. PhD grad's uh, sports car uh, in the snow, and I and I didn't. I don't think I ruined his transmission, and I didn't crash the car. <laughs> so. All right. Uh